Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge and congratulate the Honourable Michelle Roberts, not only on the appointment as the Speaker, but for being the first woman to be the Speaker of the House. It is especially fitting since this year represents 100 years since the first woman entered Parliament. Of course, Edith Cowan was not only the first female elected to the West Australian Parliament, but she was also the first female elected in any Australian Parliament. This is one of the themes I would like to highlight in my first speech in this place. I would like to begin by acknowledging all First Nations people and pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Special acknowledgement goes to the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation on whose land we are gathered on today. It was a privilege to be so warmly welcomed and smoked last Thursday so that we can safely undertake the important business of this place. Naji Gudijin, Naiwai Nilawal, Davina Diana, Janu Yari, Janu Rubibi. Sorry. How are you all? My name is Davina Diana. I am a Yarra woman from Broome. Unfortunately, unfortunately, like many, that is the extent of my ability to speak the language of which my ancestors have spoken before me. I want my kids and all other First Nation kids to know our language and understand why their mother and other mothers cannot speak it. I also have Bari, Numanbur and Gija connections. My bloodline connects me to both the East and West Kimberley. I stand here today as a proud Kimberley Aboriginal woman with strong lineage. I am grateful, I am fortunate and I am truly honoured to be representing the Kimberley electorate and all people of the Kimberley. As the fourth and latest Aboriginal member for the Kimberley, I am standing on the shoulders of giants who have gone before me. The Honourable Ernie Bridge first won the Kimberley seat in 1986 and 10 years later became the first Indigenous Cabinet Minister of any Australian government. He was followed by Ms Carol Martin, who was the first Aboriginal woman ever elected to any Australian government. She was followed by Ms Josie Farrar, my distinguished pre predecessor. These trailblazers have made my path to this place much straighter and easier to navigate. It is with this relatively recent history, combined with an ancient history, that I entered this place to share my story. Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to describe the Kimberley from my perspective, as someone who has grown up there and lived my whole life there. The Kimberley is a beautiful, vast and rugged country. It is a place of the most unique and oldest living cultures in the world. From magnificent untouched landscapes, winding ancient rivers, to the mighty red coloured Pindan cliffs, to the sandy desert soil and pristine blue waters and beaches, the Kimberley is a place of great magnitude and natural beauty. The coastlines are home to long stretches of untouched beaches, including the Dampier Peninsula, a place that is close to my heart. As a saltwater woman, being near the sea is where I feel most connected. It is the salt, sand and pristine turquoise waters that calms me. All this combined with the hot Kimberley sun, endless blue skies and clean fresh air fills me with the sense of belonging and the essence of who I am. It is a symbiotic re relationship that I have with country. I am truly blessed. Through the centre of the Kimberley are the back ranges of the Gibb River Road. Endless and timeless beauty of high rangelands, roadside springs and waterfalls, all the way up to the beautiful Lake Argyle and across to the, to the desert where in this wet season we saw it turn green in abundance, doing what it has to do every year to keep country alive. Nourishing the land and all its inhabitants, feeding into the beautiful waterways like the National Heritage listed mighty Fitzroy River known by its people as the Marawada. Through decades of working and living across the Kimberley, I have had the privilege to travel throughout the Kimberley many times over. Each time, a new appreciation and understanding comes to me. It resonates though, ancient in geological terms, country is still well and truly alive now in our present existence. 
This country is home to saltwater people, river people, and the desert people, and they are all connected spiritually, culturally, and geographically, a relationship where one is connected to the other. We have a mixture of all different cultures, from the many different Aboriginal language groups to the rich and deep multicultural historic influence of the pearling industry, the gold rush, and the most recent race to populate the vast and rugged country over the last century. All these stories, both Indigenous and non-Indigenous, needs to be learned to acquire a better understanding of where we are today and why we find ourselves here. Truth-telling is not only for young future generations, but for all people, no matter their age, race, or class. The Kimberley electorate is remote and geographically very large. To put it into perspective, the electorate is twice the size of the state of Victoria. It is home to six major towns and numerous Aboriginal homeland communities, as well as several pastoral lands and stations. Industries such as tourism, hospitality, and mining drive the local economies. But to me, more than anything else, the Kimberley is my home. It is the place I have lived my entire life. I was born in Broome, the eldest child of nine siblings. My parents were young when they married in Broome, and they had their children soon after. They too have lived all their lives in the Kimberley, as did their parents, my grandparents, and our old people before them. My mother and father worked hard to support our big family. My mother, Deborah, was the second eldest child of nine children also. She was born to Ernest and Bernadette Rahman. They came from a multicultural background of Filipino, Aboriginal, and Torres Strait Islander. They were hard workers that worked hard to provide for their children their whole life. Pop with the Public Works Department and Nana with the Broome Hospital. I had the privilege of being raised in my early years by them and was taught the fundamental values of family, commitment, hard work and caring for others. My father Albert Cox is the eldest child of six. He was born to David and Dorothy Cox. They were both taken from their families as children and placed into dormitories at Beagle Bay Mission, north of Broome, on the Dampier Peninsula. It is there that they married and raised all their children, including many of the children of their extended families. They were part of the stolen generation. My Lulu died when, when I was only one and a half years old. He was a well-respected man, a man of great courage. He was a leader for his community, he was the first Aboriginal man to become the chairperson for Beagle Bay Mission in 1972. Both he and Nana were seen as role models in Beagle Bay. My Nana Dorothy was a strong and proud woman. Her matriarchal role of keeping her family together was always her first priority. Her later years were spent in Broome and saw her work with many local organisations and women groups advocating to stand together against domestic violence as well as carrying the message of the importance of education and housing for local people. Each year during NAIDOC week, Nana would march proudly in Broome and wore her Aboriginal colours. Sadly, Nana passed away six years ago, but her legacy still lives on. I am evidence of that legacy. I know she would be proud of me standing here today. When I was young, Dad worked away a lot and Mum took care of the family home with the children while she was studying to be an Aboriginal health worker at the same time. Being the eldest child with relatively young parents meant I had to step up. Looking out for my younger brothers and sisters taught me strength, courage and responsibility at a young age and at times brought a fair amount of anxiety under the pressure of obligation. There were many hard times struggles and challenges. I remember at times we did not have enough money to put food on the table. At other times though, like when we went camping and fishing with our families, there was more than enough food to eat. Living off the land was always exciting times for my family and to this day I continue that practice of going back to country where I now take my own family to the same old camping and fishing spots in and around Broome and the Dampier Peninsula and across the Kimberley. As I stand here with plenty of nerves about delivering my first speech in this place, I have been thinking about, I've been thinking about what I can say to explain the challenges and issues the people of the Kimberley face and what changes need to happen. 
What can I say that hasn't already been said by my predecessor and those before her? I have come to the conclusion that now is not the time for more words. We need to act and we need to act now. My upbringing has led me to work across many different sectors in the Kimberley, including social and emotional well-being, education and native title. Through these roles, I have always seen myself as an advocate or a conduit for making sure voices that aren't being heard or being silenced are amplified. I get a sense of fulfillment when I see people succeed and often find myself rooting for the underdog. The future of the Kimberley is what drives me to step up. The young people of the Kimberley are the future and we are the ones and they are the ones who inspire me every day. It is so important for young people to have role models from their own community in the public eye. I want to show our young people that they don't need to be afraid and encourage them to step up and participate and have their voices heard. I am here to focus on delivering more opportunities for the people of the Kimberley, but it's not only about creating these opportunities, we need to make sure that we are building the capacity for the community to take these opportunities up. This means having better education, safe housing, and strengthening our social and emotional well-being. My focus will be about building a stronger, cohesive community that not only survives, but thrives. Aboriginal Australians are, are the most researched people in the world. There are countless reports about the many issues in the Kimberley Aboriginal people face, such as the fetal alcohol spectrum disorder studies in Fitzroy Crossing, yet we still have the dire outcomes. We have well-funded youth programs, yet we still have disempowered, disengaged youth who are committing offences instead of dreaming big, striving and being mentored as our future leaders. We have mining companies making millions out of our land, but still our people are poor. Make no mistake, with the right consultation, support, education and engagement, Aboriginal people have the ability to enjoy all the benefits modern society has to offer. We want to participate. We want to work. What we don't want is to be tokens or to be tick box processes that have to be managed on the side so that others can reap the benefits of our land. We don't need people to tell us what we need. We know what we need. We just need a fair go. Or to put it fair more eloquently, as Noel Pearson wrote, we need a hand up and not a hand out. We need help to increase our opportunities to the same as any other Australians. Our basic standard of living should be the same. Former Prime Minister Tony Abbott once said, living in a remote Aboriginal community is a lifestyle choice. <laughs> not quite. He should have said, living in a remote Aboriginal community is not a choice, it is our life. Country is the core of our culture. Tony Abbott's comments were fuel to a fire that the West Australian Barnett government ignited. They wanted to close our remote communities because the Commonwealth government were backing out of providing municipal and essential services and expecting state governments to foot the future bills. My concern is many remote communities were ultimately left to barely exist rather than being afforded opportunities they need to thrive. There are positive things happening in our communities, but all too often, 10 positive media, media stories are overshadowed by one negative story. We must change the narrative. So what are the positives? The Kimberley is a tourism mecca where tens of thousands of people from all over the globe travel to that, to, for that quintessential outback remote and cultural experience with our traditional custodians on land. From the Ord River boat cruises to the challenges of conquering the Gibb River Road, or the air and sea adventures to see the famous tidal horizontal falls, to riding the camels on Cable Beach, from a, fishing, from a fishing tour to catch a barra to seeing the ancient dinosaur footprints on a low tide at Cable Beach, or to relax in one of the many luxurious holiday apartments and hotels, and to see the world famous staircase to the moon on the king tides. There are a multitude of diverse community festivals and Aboriginal art galleries where you can buy the original and even meet the artists. You can even visit my second home, the Dampier Peninsula, where the newly sealed road will bring influx of visitors as well as great economic, social and community opportunity for traditional owners and local Aboriginal businesses. 
With opportunity comes great responsibility. In the Kimberley, these are both enormous. Some are claiming we could be the food bowl of the world. With that comes pressure to access land and water for agriculture, horticulture, and aquaculture. The Kimberley has vast resources of oil and gas. With that comes the responsibility, managing access, and environmental concerns. These opportunities and responsibilities alongside the tourism industry will all have an impact on the Kimberley and its people. In my view, there must be stringent measures put in place to deal with the impact of these industries will have on the land and people of the Kimberley. The question for me is, who will be the greatest beneficiaries of these industries in the long term? Will investments in projects across the Kimberley help individuals, families, and remote communities on whose these lands and industries are built upon? I would think that in no doubt should, but in the if the recent past is anything to go by, I think I am right to an absolute minimum keep asking the questions. I commit in this place my utmost to advocate on behalf of the voices of Kimberley Aboriginal people and all people of the Kimberley who are committed to the same vision and mission. That is to ensure that our level of living is well above the current level. To see people in the Kimberley living below the poverty line is completely and utterly unacceptable in this day and age. There are a lot of people in the Kimberley, both indigenous and non-indigenous, who understand the imbalance of access to services that we have compared to the, people, to the people in the city here in Perth. This year marks the 30 year anniversary of the end of the landmark, landmark Royal Commission into Indigenous Deaths in Custody. Speaker, may I have an extension? Extension granted. Thank you. Since then, more than 475 Aboriginal people have died in custody. Just in the last week, we have seen the sixth death in custody in less than two months. 30 years ago, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders made up just over 14% of adult prisoners. Now that has more than doubled to roughly 29%. Despite Indigenous Australians comprising less than 4% of the total population, this is a national shame, but it is also a shame on our state. My grandson. <laughs> Between 2008 and 2019, WA has recorded the highest number of Indigenous deaths in custody out of any, any state or territory in Australia. That number is sitting at 51. Black Lives Matter. We need to do better. This place needs to do better. I know that being the member for the Kimberley will not be an easy task and will be one of the greatest challenges I will face. But I also know with courage, support and commitment, I can bring the voices of the Kimberley people to this parliament to be heard. I would also like to acknowledge and pay homage to those who have helped me on my journey here to this place. To all those in the WA Labor Movement who have believed in me, helped me organize a massive campaign across the Kimberley and mentored me along the way. Emily's List, the WA Party Office, the Premier, Honourable Mark McGowan, known by my kids as Uncle Mark, <laughs> Steve McCartney, Alex Cassie, Ali Whitaker, the Honourable Stephen Dawson, Nikki Slevin, Akira Boardman, and other ministers and members that offered support and encouragement along the way. Special mention goes to the Broome Labour Branch members. Thank you to all my supporters along the way, everyone who helped me in my cam campaign in many forms across the Kimberley, from Bijidanga to Kalambaru to Kananara to Balgo, and literally everywhere in between. There are too many to name. A very special and sincere thank you to my family, my husband Angelo, my husband, my husband Angelo, got mentioned twice. <laughs> My children Hazali, Angelica, Salvatore, Kiani, and Kiani's husband, whose name I cannot say for cultural reasons, but feel the need to mention. My, my grandchildren Clade, Ali, Giuseppe, Exenia, and Junior, for all understanding and supporting me on this new journey. My mother Deborah and my father Albert, who made me who I am today, and my siblings Renee, Susanna, Serena, Lillian, Russell, Richard, Deanne, and Scott. 
my beautiful grandparents who my beautiful grandparents who also contributed to my core values, Dorothy Cox, David Cox, Ernest Rahman, and not forgetting my beautiful grandmother, Mary Bernadette Rahman, who celebrates her 80th birthday at the end of this month. Not to mention my extended, not to forget my extended families, my aunties and uncles and cousins, whom I know as my other mothers, fathers, sisters, and brothers. My beautiful mother-in-law, Noni Jarlett, and wonderful family of in-laws, including Alu and Timothy Trust. A great amount of respect and gratitude to the young and old people in the Kimberley, whom which I've had the pleasure of working for, with, and being educated, inspired, and pushed forward by to take up this responsibility. To those people who gave me opportunities and believed in me, even when I did not believe in myself or the importance of talking up for those who do not have a voice. And to the people of the Kimberley, I promise to ensure that the voices of the Kimberley people are brought to this place and ensure that the visions of Kimberley people are known by all in here. And I'll be doing it as a proud member of the McGowan Labor team. Family is bigger and way, way more important to me than anything else on earth. To me, family is un understanding where I fit in this world. It is obligation, respect, discipline, safety, assurance, and fighting. Yes, sometimes with each other, but mostly what I mean is fighting for each other and with each other. <laughs> we fight every day to improve our lives and protect those we love. It is a, it, it is a striving, yearning desire to lift each other up and sometimes drag each other kicking and screaming from the brink of a terrible place, physically, mentally, and spiritually. I am here to fight for our people, all the people of the Kimberley. I want to make sure we leave our country and community in a better place than we found it for our children, our grandchildren, and young people. Galia. Thank you, member. Uh, the member